Good evening or afternoon or morning, whatever the case may be. I'm Paul Beckwith with the University of Ottawa and also with Carleton University, teaching many courses, um, mostly at Ottawa U, but more recently at Carleton. So I'm gonna continue this um, a previous video, video where I talked about what's happening on the Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf in terms of methane, what the latest science um, from a paper that was just released within the last few days has been saying about, about the methane emissions from the shelf and the structure of the permafrost in the shelf. So for subsea permafrost, it was long thought that the duration of warming is more important than the surface temperatures themselves. Because in order to start thawing, you have to reach an equilibrium temperature where the external environmental temperature um, uh, per that heat transfers into the permafrost and, and uh, thaws the permafrost. So it, as long as the temperature is above uh, the thaw point, about zero degrees of the permafrost, and the stuff will thaw, once it's thawed, it's no longer permafrost. Bacteria can start decomposing the organic matter, um, which they can't do when it's in frozen state. And there's, if there's no oxygen available, it produces methane through anaerobic decomposition. So there's computer models have looked at how long it would take heat to transfer through the different layers of permafrost. And they come up with numbers like hundreds of years or thousands of years. But what we're seeing, the observations are, are we're seeing this happening now um, in the Arctic in front of our very eyes. So these models are once again not, uh, they're, 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 they're just not sufficient to explain what is happening in reality. There's gas migration pathways that are, that are letting, uh, providing um, migration, um, the, the providing pathways for the gas to bubble up and come out. So what's important is, so the thaw point and how long the warming has lasted. Okay, so as the, uh, war the warmer, the warmer, the longer the duration of the warmer period, the thinner the subsea permafrost, and therefore the uh, unfrozen regions can lead to gas migration pathways, letting the methane come up. So in many places, the permafrost has reached that thaw point. In other areas, um, it hasn't reached it, it's getting close. So we need to really, um, if it's not reached, we can get linear emissions, okay? Slightly warmer temperature, smaller linear amounts of methane are coming up. But as you get these weak points in the sediment, those linear trends can quickly be become exponential. And the point here is it's a fine line between those two states, okay? So um, they use the expression turning point, or you can say a threshold, or you can say a tipping point, or you can say an abrupt change where the linear change actually becomes exponential. And we're seeing that in all kinds of different metrics in the climate system. Um, okay, so when we talk about linear changes, you know, those changes are can be slow over long periods of time. When we're talking about exponential changes, every single year matters. There's a huge difference, okay? So the whole Eastern Siberian Arctic shelf is about two million square kilometers. So Shikova and Similitov estimate that about 10% of that, 200,000 square kilometers, have what are called hot spots within them, areas where methane is observed as being far greater than a low background area. Okay, so is a sudden burst of methane feasible? This was a, a burst of 50 gigatons was modeled by um, Wadhams in, I believe, uh, 2013 in a paper that he did with an economist, and they found that would cause an impact to the global economy of about $70 trillion. So let's have a look. Well, what is the background? The background is something on the order of three milligrams of methane being released per square meter per day, okay? That's in the background area. That's in 90% of the Eastern Siberian Arctic shelf. What we're seeing in these hot zones or hot spots are up to three 
kilograms, 3,000 grams per square meter per day. Uh, uh, okay, so if you take the ratio, 3,000 gram, grams to 3 milligrams, which is 3 thousandths of a gram, the ratio is, um, the ratio is 10 to the cube times 10 to the cubed or 10 to the 6. It's six orders of magnitude. Now, there's some variation in these numbers, so the paper is arguing three to five orders of magnitude um, change a, a difference between them. So, in other words, in the, meth in the hot spots or the hot zones on 10% of the continental shelf, we have very large amounts of methane coming up. And this is the difference between linear and exponential. Okay, if the hot spot area um, doubled, there'd be a huge difference in emissions. Okay, or three times an even bigger difference. Also, you know, could there be a gigaton release? She said she doesn't know, but the, she can't exclude this scenario. What would be the argument to exclude this scenario? Okay, uh, I mean, five orders of magnitude difference. You know, this is, an er this, this is a huge factor difference. So also, as gases are bubbling up, through the unfrozen regions, they carry, they mix sediments and take things with them. They, the hole can be larger and larger and larger. The gas migration pathways will grow. So not only will the area of hot spots grow, but the size of the migration pathways grows. So we get exponential growth. Okay, now the thing is, is it's not just methane in the form of hydrates. There's lots of methane in, form, in the form of free gas especially below the hydrate stability zone, which is only a couple hundred meters thick. So this free gas has accumulated for hundreds of thousands, even million, a million years. So there's huge amounts of this gas, and it's a high pressure, so it, can, it goes up through those weak spots just as much as the thawing hydrates. So this could allow a large release, you know, an outburst, a bomb, whatever you want to call it, a methane clathrate gun. Um, so, you know, a lot of, the, the more we find out about this system, the more worrying it looks. This is why, you know, it's very easy to argue at this stage that we're in a climate change emergency. So how do we know these hydrates are there? Well, they're just drilling in and they're finding them there. Okay, um, the hydrates are only one form of possible reservoir. Okay, the, the methane that is in gaseous, gaseous form is, is, is huge compared to what's just in the hydrates. The hydrate layers are a few hundred meters and are therefore a very small fraction compared to the thousands of meters or of underlying gas charged sediments. Okay, so how much methane's in the atmosphere right now? Okay, there's five billion tons of methane in the Earth's atmosphere right now, five gigatons. That's about 1% of the frozen methane hydrate store in the East Siberian Arctic shelf. So if 1% is released, that would double the level of methane in the atmosphere. But the hydrate pool is only a small fraction of the total methane. Okay, um, the, 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 the depth of the, okay, so there's a sedimentary drape, there's sedimentary rock which goes down, it's a few kilometers in places, up to 20 kilometers deep in places. So that's just rock, it doesn't contain um, gas or, or methane, at least not significant amounts, it's believed. So it's the sediments that are lying above that that contain the, the gas. So it doesn't make any difference if the gas coming up is from the hydrates or the free gas deposits, it's the pressure is high if there's a pathway, if the cork is off the bottle, it can come up, it's ready, ready to go. So, the, uh, now this says the estimated amount of hydrates is 1500 gigatons, so if 1% of that would be 15 gigatons, and that's three times what's in the present atmosphere. So, not sure how that number is different, because I thought 1% would, would uh, release five gigatons and not 15 gigatons, so there's a bit of ambiguity there, which needs to be clarified. Um, the hydrates are there, okay? There's a lot of, been a lot of disbelief from scientists because, because uh, you know, the, the, the depth is only 50 meters of water over that shelf. But South Korean expedition, 
measured and sampled these hydrates recently. They're going to publish the data soon. Okay, so observations show that the hydrates are there and the paper, the recent paper shows that the gas front is propagating in the sediment. So in other words, the, uh, the permafrost is not, it, that, that's closer to the surface is thawing um, and the thaw line is going deeper and deeper. So how do we know that the, that the, um, okay, so how do we know that the, that there's hydrates? Why should there be hydrates existing there? Okay, well, we've already, from this curve, if you just have seawater, um, you can go down about 300 meters and you can get hydrate formation on the surface of the seafloor. Now, the Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf is 50 meters deep. So we got to account for another 250 meters of water. Okay, the density, so we need to look at the density of materials. Density of water, one gram per cubic centimeter. The density of many sediments, of many rocks and things on continental shells is about 2.7, up to 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter. The density of rock on the seafloor, about three. It's about three, up to three. It's about three times higher than water. So in order to have, in order to account for uh, 250 meters of water, right? We've got 50 meters of water on the shelf. We need to account for 250 more meters of water, divide by three by the density ratio. That's about 83, 80 to 85 meters or so. So, so if you go down 50 meters of in the water column to the seafloor, and then you go down about 85 meters in the sediments, then the pressure will be sufficient to form hydrates. That's if it's all the sediments are all a density of three. Usually there's pores and there's water in those and there's gaps, so it's less than three. So you might have to go down 100 meters or you know, 150 meters in the sediments to get the pressure. But it's certainly, um, that's the mechanism, that's the physics of, of what's going on in that region. Okay, so let's go back here. So, okay. Um, the other thing that I would like to point out is I'm going to talk about the, the uh, features of, um, you know, when a glacier covers an area and then it leaves, there are certain features that are on the land, there's certain, um, the uh, ground can freeze because it's exposed to the air, you get the permafrost frozen, but you have areas, you have lakes and things. And so these lakes in this so-called thermokarst region can look like this, right? You get all these different pock barked lakes. And if you go and look at the detail of the lake, then underneath the lake, there's a thaw region. If this is all permafrost all around, this whole region was originally permafrost. The lake is there, the area underneath gets thawed out. And this is called a talic, okay? Areas of unfrozen ground. So what happens when we inundate this whole thing, sea level rises, we inundate this thing with seawater, okay, it has been thought that this, the seawater near, near, it can be near minus 1.8 degrees Celsius before it freezes, goes down, percolates through, and freezes this talic to make it an, to, to, to make the cork, give the cork, if you like, integrity so that methane can't come up through. But that is not so clearly happening now. So what, let's go over to here and see what happens. So, so uh, here's, okay, so this is taking a little bit longer to explain. I'm probably going to extend to a third video, so I don't have to rush too much. I just want to, I try to keep these videos to about 15 minute uh, segments because I find, you know, that's sort of an optimal time. You know, TED Talks are 18 minutes. These videos are 15 um, you know, if it's, if, if it, it keeps me from trying, you know, it keeps me on point. Um, so let's have a look. So here we have a schematic of going through depth. We have 50 meters of water here and we we're going down in the sediments and the, you know, this is, um, I'm going to go through the sequence of this, um, in the next video. So thank you for listening.